some of my no graduation days in just like a glorious day. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, and I want to acknowledge that in a room like this, people came to this moment, this day, from many, many different directions and different paths. Uh, some of us maybe always expected to be here. We had financial support. We had family support. Uh, others of us did not have those things. Uh, many of you may have navigated your studies while taking care of children, while taking care of family members. Some of you were doing your studies while you navigated disabilities. Uh, others uh, were doing their studies while they dealt with a curriculum that didn't reflect them. There are many ways that we come to this moment and yet you all share something really important right now, which is even one more level up on status uh, and resource. Right? Only 12% of the population gets a graduate degree. And that degree will open doors for you, regardless of how, what exactly your field is or, or what you will go forth to do, you have one more level of status. And that means you're going to be sitting at the tables where decisions are made, for people who are not sitting at those tables. And in many ways that we have not actually been taught or given any consistent message that it's important for us to know uh, or consider them as we make those decisions. You know, we are in a moment now where people who do the kind of work that I do, it's actually easier. I mean, I never used to worry about being shot while I did my work. And I'll be honest, that, that's something I have to deal with today. But what makes it easier is that we're done with this post-racial narrative. I mean, nobody is as claiming we're post-racial. And it also makes it very clear that, certainly unlike the way I was taught, to see history as this arc of progress, history is not an arc of progress. It's, it's cyclic, right, cyclic. Uh, and that when we make progress, we have to defend that progress relentlessly. Uh, and we can never be complacent. So I want to um, open with a quote from Audre Lorde, where she says, the true focus of revolutionary change is never merely the oppressive situations which we seek to escape, but that piece of the oppressor which is planted deep within each of us and which knows only the oppressor's tactics, the oppressor's, oppressor's relationships. So I um, am a proudly angry feminist. <laughs> And I have spent most of my life thinking deeply about sexism and patriarchy, thinking deeply about classism and heterosexism. Those are forms of oppression for which I uh, suffered, if you will. And so I thought a lot about them. When you swim against the current, it's, it's pretty clear that there's a current and that you're, using, you're, you're putting out effort, but the uh, outcome of that effort is very different when you're swimming against the current. But I was in my 30s, I was a parent, I was uh, certified as highly educated by our institutions of higher learning before I ever thought about where I colluded in and participated in and benefited from somebody else's oppression. So I'm pretty sure that most people here know my work and I was asked to speak, so I'm gonna speak about what my work is about, which is a one particular key identity, which is whiteness. Um, and also because not only do I look out and see a lot of white people, but I think I'm looking out and looking at a lot of white progressives too. Yeah. And white progressives are my specialty. Did you guys know that? <laughs> white progressives are my specialty. And why is that? Because I'm a huge white progressive. Uh, I, I like to jokingly say when I first applied for a job in the early 90s, leading people, primarily white employees, in discussions of race and racism in interracial teams here with a person of color by my side. I actually thought I was qualified to do that because I was a vegetarian. <laughs> I mean, how could I be racist as a vegetarian? I would need to be vegan today, but you know, I was pretty good in the 90s. I have that, that kind of thinking that this is about openness, right? That if we're for social justice and who isn't, then we automatically do social but of course, that's not true, right? This is not natural, and it's not automatic. Uh, and so I actually think that white progressives cause the most daily hostility and toxicity for people of color. And that would be every white progressive in this room. And what do I mean by a white progressive? I don't mean Democrat versus Republican. I just mean any white person sitting in this room thinking it couldn't be me. 
or it isn't me, or if I just knew this about you know you, I'd know why it wasn't you, or sitting here thinking about some other white person that really should be hearing this right now. Um, I think that we white progressives can cause the most daily harm because, yes, a Richard Spencer, I can only imagine, I would be terrified to interact with Richard Spencer. I can only imagine what it would be like to be a person of color uh, and interact with Richard Spencer. But odds are, on a daily basis, the people of color in this room aren't interacting with Richard Spencer, they're interacting with me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I have spent most of my life unable to answer the question, what does it mean to be white? And I have found in 20 years of asking white people that question, well-intended white progressives, uh, like those of us in this room, most white people cannot answer that question. And that's not actually, but not, well, you're white progressives, so you might throw in the word privilege, but, but let's be honest. Most of us can't really answer that question, and most of us don't actually live integrated lives. Right? And if you're wondering, right, whether you do or don't, or whether having co-workers of color or having a, a, a professor here of color means you live an integrated life, I would just ask you if you're married to open up your, your wedding album and take a look. That, that wedding album represents your circle. Uh, and most of us have overwhelmingly white wedding albums, right? So most of us cannot answer that question with any depth or nuance or, or uh, criticality. And collectively, that creates a hostile environment for the people of color that are interacting with us, that are living and working in primarily, and being led by white people uh, in primarily white spaces. Because if I can't tell you what it means to be white, I cannot hold what it means not to be white. And I'm going to likely refuse your reality. Right? And people of color in these environments know that most of us can't answer that question uh, beyond some pretty superficial, predictable platitudes. And that means they can't be their authentic selves. Uh, and the people of color in these environments spend an inordinate amount of energy trying to keep us white people comfortable and not unsettle us racially, lest it actually get worse for them. Because that's usually what happens. It gets worse, not better. Right? Because if I can't think critically about that question, uh, I'm going to have no skills whatsoever to navigate that conversation and no emotional capacity to withstand the discomfort of that conversation. Right? Uh, and you are going to be in these positions. You are going to be leading. And what I'm trying to do here is just challenge the complacency that so many of us who are progressive have. So I hope every white person right now in this room is thinking, I wonder if it's me that has sent a coworker or a colleague home uh, to agonize all night long whether it was worth it to try to talk to me about my unaware racist views and biases and, and perspectives, uh, and decided in the end that it wasn't worth it to talk to me about it, right? Uh, I hope you're asking that question of yourselves? Is it me that has sent a coworker home or a colleague? And I'm going to give you the answer. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it was. We have to start from the assumption that it is, of course, us, that we are an inevitable product of the water we're swimming in. And that changes the question from if to how. Right? How is it me? And more importantly, how do I know? To whom am I accountable? Right? Niceness is not anti-racism. Niceness is not courageous. And niceness will not get racism and any other form of oppression on the table when everybody pretty much wants it off the table. Right? In fact, you may not be seen as particularly nice. And by the way, I'm not saying don't be nice, because that's better than nothing. Go ahead, be nice. <laughs> that's not anti-racism. Friendliness is not anti-racism. It takes strategic, intentional, ongoing commitment and courage, right? And it takes accountability. It's not going to happen through smiling uh, and, and good intentions. Right? So I have, I have mentioned, I grew up in poverty. Right? Uh, when I say I grew up in poverty, I mean that explicitly. Right. Periods of homelessness, living in our car. I actually grew up in uh, the Bay Area, San Jose, Redwood City, 
uh, foster care. I didn't go to college until I was in my 30s. Uh, and I also always knew that I was white. Right? We cannot use the places where we have uh, experienced oppression to exempt ourselves from where we experience advantage and where we collude with somebody else's. So I want to just share quickly what this intersection looks like for me at this point in my life. So clearly I was late to academia. That's why, I mean, graduation day is a really big deal. Uh, I'll never forget mine. Um, and yet in academia, I always feel like an imposter, right? Day late, dollar short. Uh, and I haven't been groomed all my life to be there. And yet, I study racism. I've studied it for many, many years. I've been in the struggle for many, many years. I actually went from practice to theory. Not like a lot of academics that go from theory to practice. And so I see it. I notice it in the room. Right? I'm in a faculty meeting. I notice it in the room. And I want to say something, but I feel inferior intellectually to the people in the room. Right? I'm just sure that I actually used to think um, that the smart kids went to college. And then I got to college. <laughs> yeah, no, this is not about the cream rising. This is about uh, advantage and expectations, right? So I'm sitting in that room, and I want to speak up and name what I'm seeing, but I feel intimidated. I'm sure someone's going to quote some research I haven't read, and so I'm silent. I am not feeling superior. I am feeling inferior. But when I stepped out of myself and asked myself, and how is your silence functioning in this room? Because that's all that really matters. Not what your intentions are, but how it's functioning. I thought, oh my goodness, I'm colluding with racism. In fact, I'm going to get ahead by my silence on this topic. I can tell you one thing, you want to get ahead in academia, don't bring up racism. I'm going to be seen as a team player through my silence. I am going to benefit from this silence, and that is not acceptable to me. And when I realized that, I also realized, and it's a lie, that you are not as smart as these people because you grew up poor. So when you push through all that internalized lie of your own oppression, uh, you are healing that, and simultaneously using your privileged position as a white person to break with white solidarity. So for me, centering race in my, in my analysis and my work has been an incredible way to address all uh, axes of identity. And so I don't think about it as one or the other. I don't have any less racial privilege or less racism because I grew up poor. I also, by the way, don't have more. Um, I just learned my place in the racial hierarchy from a different class position than a middle class white girl learned hers. But I learned it. Right? Um, so I think about it as saliency. Different identities are more or less salient in different moments in different contexts. And those are the questions we always want to be asking ourselves. I, my pronouns are she and her, but I really, really would love when we are at a table making a decision that is going to affect the lives of people, that we not just go around the room and say our pronouns, but we also say what our racial identity is. So that we notice who's missing from this table and how will they be impacted. And how do we know? So this is the most liberating, transformative premise you can start from. That of course you've been thoroughly socialized, if you are white, into a racist worldview. You have racist biases. You have racist patterns as a result of all of that. And you also have an investment in the system of racism. Because it's comfortable for those of us who are white, and it has definitely helped us navigate the barriers that we do face. Right? And we also have investments in not seeing that, which is why we cannot be trusted. <laughs> I do not call myself an ally or an anti-racist. That is for people of color to decide if at any given moment I'm behaving in those ways. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so, it is incredibly liberating and transformative to start from that premise. I didn't choose to be socialized in the ways that I guess named, but I was. And I just got to tell you, anything you would want to tell me, and certainly anything if you were white that you would want to tell a person of color that you think makes you less racist or exempts you, trust me, it's not working. All right? So uh, be accountable, relentlessly accountable. Uh, and that is liberating and transformative. Because then we can stop defending, deflecting, denying. And get to work actually aligning what we profess to value with the practice of our lives. So 
So, so let me just repeat, congratulations. You will be at tables where decisions are made. Uh, and be, be that beacon, be that light uh, for other people. Uh, and thank you so much. Mm -hmm.